Good morning. Have you ever done something that you instantly regretted? Like you crossed the line and said, oh man. Like, I don't know, I hear this happens, but in, in the context of a marriage, sometimes there's argument. I don't know, I hear this happens. There's arguments. <laughs> and then in those arguments, again, I've heard that sometimes you say things that you didn't mean, right? And then, so you, you, you let those comments out and instantly you go, oh, but it's too late, right? Anyone ever done something and said, man, that wasn't worth it? We're gonna read about a circumstance of one of the most instantly regrettable, probably the most instantly regrettable instances in, in the history of mankind. But I wanna go back as we study the Genesis series because last week we studied creation and God's creativity and his purpose and plan in creating in Genesis at the beginning. And we understood and we knew that everything was good. God emphasized it six times. This is good. And so this was the good life. Like it, it couldn't get better than that. God and man fellowshipping together. It's what we yearn for. God and man, Garden of Eden, God blessing the man, walking with them, talking with them. It's like, it's what we go out to the woods to do. Like we, we'll book a weekend retreat and just try and hear from God, right? They did that all the time. It was good. This was in the context of Genesis 2 here. I want to revisit it. Genesis 2.15, the Lord took the man, put him in the Garden of Eden to work and to keep it. That's our theology of work and career. The Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you'll surely die. And so what God does is place parameters on their relationship, which is healthy, correct? Like, this is, these are parameters and boundaries in our relationship and parameters placed on how worship will be done, which from the living God is reasonable. But is this the work of a good God? Like why put the tree there in the first place is the question that people often ask. Is God truly good? I wanna take you to Genesis 3. Genesis 3 tells us uh, about an animal, the serpent in Genesis 3.1. The serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say? So what we got here is an animal named by Adam, created by God, speaking to Eve. Is that weird to anybody else? Yeah, it's, it's bizarre. Right? Now we have biblical occurrences of animals speaking before, but in this instance, what is happening here is there's a demonic possession of this certain snake, the serpent. So we'll understand it from here based on the conversation they have that this is a demonic possessed snake possessed by the chief of all demons, Satan. He said to the woman, did God actually say, sounds like Satan to me, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, you may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. So I don't know about you, but we've always grown up in neighborhoods where there's that fence with ferocious dogs behind it, right? And we were told, don't go over there. Don't touch those dogs. Don't even look at those dogs, right? Like, you will die, right? Like, this is ferocious, right? Like, don't go near. This is the tree. It was a place you weren't supposed to go. The serpent said to the woman, you won't surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. Sounds tempting. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, the tree was to be desired to make one wise. She took of its fruit. She also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. And so we have a little more light on the situation 
that she was never alone, that her husband Adam was with her the entire time and was a witness to the lies. And what Adam did was he watched her eat, the, eat from the fruit and go, something happened to her? I want some now, right? There's all kinds of cowardice in that. Just, okay. And he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. It's like instantly. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. I mean, this is Eden. This is wonderful. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord among the trees of the garden. The Lord called to the man, said to him, where are you? Does God not know where Adam and Eve are? It's, um, he's inviting them out from their hiding in shame. And he said, verse 10, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. And he, God said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Woman, it's your fault. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent, the serpent deceived me and I ate. And then we go back, let's go down a little bit to the repercussions of this. Verse 23, therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove the man out of the east of the garden and he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way of the tree of life. As a result of this disobedience and sin by the first couple, by the apex, the first humans, they were cast out. And that's why the main point is this, say, it's real simple. When you do things your way instead of God's way, you ruin everything. God had a standard set for them. Do things my way, don't do this. And yet, this clever couple thought to themselves, well, we could listen to him, but we're gonna do things our way. Does that sound like anybody you know? Before we go any further, let's study. There's just so much going on here. Again, we won't be able to get everything, so study it in your small groups, okay? But there's a recipe for sin here that we've got to go over. How does sin come about? This is the first sin, Satan inserting his lies, which is his native language, but he is speaking to natural desires that were in the hearts of the man and woman. The first recipe for sin we see here is that they wanted the power of God wanted the power of God. For God knows when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you'll be like God. And Eve said, sounds good to me. I don't think any of you would admit that you want the power of God, right? But do you want some power? Do you want some more power? Some of you would say, I'll take power over influence, wealth. Now, you could ask the oligarchs of the world, the dictators. They want the power of God, right? They want that, like supervillain status, right? But humanity has this bend to want deity so that they don't have to sit underneath it. If you are God, you don't have to sit under the authority of God. Do you see that? All right. That's the first thing. The second thing and it has to do with the first one. The recipe for sin was they wanted to be the judge of their own right and wrong. Not only will you become like God, you will know good and evil. Does that sound like anything you've heard of? We live in a society that says, don't judge me. And then they judge morality based on what them and their three best friends think. And therefore, morality is not something that's set in stone, a standard. It's what your friend group thinks, or your core group thinks, or your peer group thinks. So something that is morally wrong, if it's accepted by popular culture, is not wrong. The recipe for sin, they want to be the judge of what's right and wrong. And our culture has lived by this and embraced it. Not God's standard 
They wanted to be the judge. And so right here in the first couple of verses, we see here a way that we can combat that sin in our lives, not wanting to sit, not wanting to be God's, but sit under God's authority, not wanting to be our own moral compass, but sit under God's moral standard. Amen? Amen? I will start this thing over. All right. All right. So here's the truth. This is the, every sin has a consequence. Write that down if you don't know that. There are no sins that will go unpunished. Okay? They affect everything. Every sin has a consequence. So it stands to reason that the first most egregious sin would carry the heaviest consequences. Now hear this. We, as a society, try to fight God's standard even to this day. Did you know that? Even based on Genesis. And I'll tell you how. You fight God's standard when you undermine the penalty for sin. God said, because of this, these things will happen. This is an order of things, a penalty I have placed based on sin. And what we do as a culture is go, nah, it's not going to be that way. We're going to do things our way. And that's how they got into trouble in the first place. Let's look at it. So there are two curses. Uh, um, there are three curses, curses for men and curses for women. And I'm anticipating losing a lot of friends today, okay? Okay. Um, this is that's just going to happen. Do you want to send the offering first, John, before I get into this? All right. All right. So there's a curse for the wives, for the women. Okay. The first is there will be intensified pain in child delivery. Two chapters ago, God created life, human life, breathed his very breath in her lungs. It's one of the most beautiful things. It's one of the most intimate things. Bringing life into being is a wonderful, joyous, miraculous thing. And now it's to be accompanied with a lot of pain and a lot of discomfort. And I envy you women. You, you're able to bring life into the world. Now it's going to be rough. Now, some people would say, well, modern medicine is a way to avert the curse. I would say, no, stop it. All right. Here's why. Anybody in here give birth and use modern medicine? Would you say that was a pain-free experience? No, okay? There's pain in labor. There's pain, like, get the doctor in here, right? And then there's pain in recovery, all right? So I think that you're still living under this one, okay? So that's not a subversion of God's curse. So let's move on to the second one, all right? So there's pain in childbirth, and we now know why. Here's the second one. Humanity tries to subvert the will of God because the curse is following the lead of her husband, Verse 16b, your desire shall be contrary to your husband, but he shall rule over you. So I'm, I think this is what happens. I don't know. Okay, so what happens is a husband and wife will disagree on something. It's never happened to me, okay? So I don't know. I'm, I'm going to take your guys's, okay? So a husband and wife will disagree on something, I guess, right? And in the disagreement, the biblical wife is supposed to take leadership from her biblical husband. She's supposed to submit to that authority as he submits to God's authority. Marriage is a partnership. The Garden of Eden, man and wife, under God. Adam was always meant to be the leader of the family, yet with Eve's sin of listening to the serpent, as, as it says here in Genesis, the result is a curse. Biblical women must follow the lead of their biblical husbands. Now, NOCC biblical women, how are we doing with that? Woo! Told you I was going to lose some friends. Now, the husband's not supposed to be a dictator, okay? Hear that, husbands. Husband's not supposed to be abusive, Hear that, husbands. There are religious cults take this scripture and abuse women. They abuse well-meaning, obedient to Jesus wives. And those men are despicable. That's not what this verse means, okay? And if you don't understand, rewind that and play it till you do. This verse means when there's a difference of views in the room, the biblical wife is supposed to defer to leadership from her biblical husband. Now, that's taking something for granted. 
What's it taking for granted? That there's a biblical husband in the marriage, okay? So here, men, if you're not prepared to lead biblically, don't get married. Men, if you're not prepared to be a sacrificial, die for my wife, husband, do not get married. Women, if you're not prepared to follow the lead of a biblical man, don't get married. Now, men, if you're in here and you're like, I'm married already and I'm not that, come to the men's ministry, we'll have you there in a year and a half, okay? You're not gonna like it, it's gonna be rough, but we'll get you, every day's like a rocky speech, like lightning and thunder, all right, so, but we'll get you there, all right? And here's the problem. The problem is the world we live in tries to undermine this truth, right? Right? This is biblical. This is Genesis. This is not even me. And yet, preaching this, you'd be called a misogynist. You'd be called all kinds of things, correct? The culture we live in, this is how I know the culture is trying to undermine this. Think of any biblical husband, I'm sorry, think of any um, husband or father in the popular culture that you know, okay? The ones that come to my head are like Homer Simpson, like Al Bundy, like these bumbling idiot husbands, right? Right? Who, who need the wife to take the lead because without that, these overgrown uh, boys, right, are going to let the family starve, Right? right? And that's what the culture is teaching us. And as a result, some well-meaning, obedient men who love the Lord have said, okay, I'm going to adopt this and have embraced this extended adolescence. And the Bible says, no. Lead. Adam, standing there while his wife is getting conned, didn't lead. Let me ask you a question, husbands. If your wife it's getting uh, conned into buying a used car that you don't need by a slick talking salesman. What are you gonna do? You better say something. If you run a credit check, I, I'm, call me, I'll be there. Right? No. They don't need this. No. Right? So there's a, there's a leadership aspect of it. And so this is the plan. And when we follow the culture, when we follow our own morality, our own rules, everything gets ruined. So God says, do it my way or everything gets ruined. All right, now there's a curse for husbands, okay? Here's the curse for husbands. Your work is gonna be difficult. You're, you will work the field, you'll scrape by, and when you're done working, you're gonna die. Some of you guys are like, yep, sounds like my job, right? You're gonna work a lot, you're gonna eat a little, and when you're done, you're gonna die. Because you have listened to the voice of your wife, you've eaten the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Verse 18, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. This is a curse. The garden had wonderful fruit trees, wonderful sustenance, and now it's just thorns and thistles. By the sweat of your face, you'll eat bread. That's the grain going to be hard till you return to the ground for out of it you were taken for you are dust and to dust you shall return death is introduced right here working in the garden of Eden was a joyful fulfilling purpose um, uh, um, receiving time it was fellowship with God but the effect of sin would be Adam continuing to work in the garden it would be awful it would be difficult and then he would die. Now this curse is specific to the husband, but I think we can responsibly, biblically say this is for either who, who choose a career, either husband or wife. The workplace has improved significantly, right? No one's working with thorns and thistles, right? Some, maybe some gardeners are, right? But here's the truth. Our job is supposed to be difficult. Like the Bible-believing Christian is supposed to have a resiliency when the job gets Hard. Now, our society tries to subvert this, right? Think of the last three years. I've heard of words like quiet quitting. I don't even know what that was, 
right? Some lady, some lady did a, a TikTok and showed what the Google offices were like. And I was like, is this heaven, right? Like it was like an espresso machine and like exercise classes and stuff. And when you don't have that, you what? Society teaches you what? If you don't get all those things, what do you do? Quit, complain. And what that'll do, I fear, for, for the young Christian, or even the old Christian who's in the career path and is kind of switching around, is that you will have this perpetual cycle of dissatisfaction in the workplace. And you'll keep looking for something that doesn't exist and that you can't ever have because of the curse. But it's humanity's, humanity's bend to try and do things differently than the curse, than the way God commanded it. Can I plant something to you Christians? The workplace is supposed to be hard. That's not an indicator that you need to quit. Work is supposed to be difficult. And when you understand this, you can survive a hard day at the office. I had a few days last week, pretty hard. Pretty hard as far as pastors go. Getting yelled at, being criticized, and a bunch of other fun stuff. And you know what I did? I went home, and I didn't like look on Indeed or something for like um, handsome pastor position. I didn't do that. Um, <laughs> sorry, God. Sorry, Steph. I, I went home, and I, I just said, that's part of the call, man. You know what I did the next day? I got up. I went to work. I didn't take it personally. That's part of it. There's going to be some real hard days, you know? And you know what my staff did? None of them went to work. Bunch of cowards. All right. <laughs> it's their holiday. It was their holiday. Now, here's the thing. You're going to have bad days, amen? It doesn't mean you quit. That's part of the curse. Keep pushing. But if you have a workplace that's abusive... If you have a workplace that's immoral, if you have a workplace that's taking advantage of you, then yeah, you should look for another one. That's not a blessing. The curse does, that mean, does, does not mean you're abused or taken advantage of, hear that, okay, by a workplace. If your work is respectable, if your work is honorable, but it's just difficult, say this with me, that's part of it. Anyone here just thought like, wow, that explains a lot, right? Anybody here? When you understand, when you have a theology that work is hard, you build a resilience for the bad days. I have a question for you. Do you guys cheat the IRS? Don't raise your hand. <laughs> I'll tell. I'll snitch. <laughs> Any of you when, you, uh, when you get a police officer pulling up behind you, you hit the gas? <laughs> any of you, any of you um, when you have a, like a restraining order, you try and uh, break that restraining order as soon as you can? No, because those are things that are set in place, right? You follow them. And yet with God's rules and God's standards, why do so many of us try and break them and do things our own way? So here's an application for you. Accept God's plan and his way. Stop trying to do things your way. When you do things your way, you will ruin it. Accept God's plans and God's way, even the curse. Okay, question, is God still good? All right, brainwashed. So that's the cursed, and that's because of sin. But there's more to this, so let's, let's clean this up. Verse, uh, Genesis 3.20. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. The Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. 22. The Lord God said, behold, the man has become like uh, one of us, knowing good and evil, now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Verse 23, here's the judgment we already read. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden. And we know that. And then placed an angel with a flaming sword there. The first bouncer saying, you're not getting in here, right? Tree of uh, the, the Garden of Eden, if the angel tried to, I mean, if Adam and Eve ever tried to come back, they couldn't. And there's the truth right here. Sin separates us from God. The, the crown jewel of creation, God's beautiful, wonderful humans, he had to cast them out. Why? Because sin is not small. Sin separated them. When sin entered, entered the picture, it ruins everything. Now, now let's, uh, let's do some housekeeping here. There's, there's more to this chapter, okay? So because of this, 
the utopia, the, the, it, is, it is good, the, the, um, the, the perfect good life, it's over. It is over. Have you guys ever sinned so much that the relationship was over after that? Wow. It's done. But there's, there's more to this. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you've done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all the beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat the rest of the days of your life. That's a, that's a form of uh, dishonor. You're going to eat the dust. That's an Old Testament term. Then there's this portion here. I will put enmity between you and the woman. So between the snake, between Satan and the woman, there would be this rivalry, this eneminess that would be inherent. And between you and your offspring and her offspring, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. Hmm. That's kind of curious, right? And then there's this, uh, go down 21. Lord God made for Adam and his wife garments of skins and clothed them. The offspring of Eve would crush the serpent's head. You know what that sounds like? It sounds like the work of Jesus on the cross. Right here in the midst of a curse, we have prophecy from the living God. That there would be, even though the sin ruins everything, egregious, you gotta go, that there would be someone who comes and Satan's gonna bruise his heel, that's the cross. It was not good, it was not fun, it was an awful thing. But in the work of the cross, the son, the offspring of the woman, would crush the snake. And in crushing the snake, all those who are under sin would be able to what? Come back to God. Come back to fellowship. Sin separates, but through Jesus you can come back. And do you know how we, he showed that, how he illustrated that? He took an animal, an animal Adam named, what is this, family pet? And God sacrificed it. This is the first killing in all of history. This has got to be awful for Adam and Eve to watch. Blood dripping. And then he took the skins and he made them clothes. But illustratively, this is more than clothes. Because he was using an example. Maybe it was a lamb that he killed. And he said, the lamb of God must die. And what I will do is I will clothe you in his righteousness. Even here in the garden, there's an illustration and a prophecy that God would make all things right through Jesus. Because because of sin, it's over. It's over. But Jesus on the cross said, for those who are in me, it, it is finished. The work of Jesus Christ is accomplished. So here it is. Sin ruins everything. Sin separates you from God. If you are not clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, you are separated from God. But here's the thing, even when the first sin was committed, God made a plan to bring sinful people back to him. If you've never trusted in Jesus Christ today, there's your invitation. You can come back to God and have a fellowship, a relationship with God that we all dream of. And for those of you who are Christians, Christ followers, if you've sinned further than you ever thought you could, be clothed in the righteousness of Jesus because it is finished. Amen? Let's pray. God, there are those who need to respond to your gospel invitation today, so I pray, Lord, that you would invite them. And for anybody here who is trying to do things their way, has messed up their life, God, I pray that through the Holy Spirit and the work of Jesus, your son, Lord, that you would fix and they would trust and they would follow your ways and your will. Some people here are fighting the curse, are fighting the way that things are supposed to be. They need to submit to your will. Would you help them to see that as well? And God, help us to live as your people doing things your way. In Jesus' name, amen.